is to talk about the difference between single crystal, polycrystalline, and amorphous materials, uh, and to talk about how the structure of matter affects its physical properties. Okay, let's talk about single crystals first. What is a single crystal? A single crystal is a material in which the crystal lattice is continuous throughout. That is, the orientation of lattice vectors in one part of the material is exactly identical to the orientation of the lattice vectors uh, in any other uh, part of the material. Another way to think about this is that I could take a unit cell in some area and I could, uh, by translating by an integral number of lattice vectors, uh, map out the atoms in some other uh, area of that material. So continuous uh, crystal lattice. Um, okay, so you might be thinking single crystals, they're kind of weird, they're an oddity, and we don't really deal with them very much. And that's not necessarily true. In fact, uh, just about every bit of computing technology that we deal with and carry around in our pockets in a cell phone, for example, uh, is built off of silicon. And so what people do is they take very large single crystals of silicon, uh, and that's called a boule. It's grown by a starting seed, and it gets larger and larger until it gets to some diameter. Um, but all of this, again, is a single crystal of silicon. And then we take it and we dice it into uh, very, very thin wafers, uh, and we deposit things, and we do photolithography on top of that. Uh, but the starting block for all of this computing technology, uh, for almost all of the devices that we carry around with us, is single crystal uh, silicon. So it's a very important thing to understand. So let's talk about our physical properties uh, of the single crystal substance. So maybe I want to talk about electrical transport. Maybe I want to talk about the elastic modulus of material. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily matter. You know, the important thing is to think about uh, how those atoms are oriented in one direction uh, relative to another. So we talked about linear dens density before. Um, that's one good example. The linear density, um, so I'm looking at a simple cubic crystal here. The linear density in the 100 direction is not the same as the linear density in, say, the 110 direction. Um, so the atoms are a little bit spaced further apart. Uh, the electronic orbitals uh, aren't overlapping as much as they are uh, in the 100 direction. And so it makes sense that the physical properties in these two directions are different. Uh, and what we say then is that they are anisotropic. So that means not the same, essentially. Um, so an anisotropic material is a material if, in which if I measure the physical properties in one direction, they're not necessarily the same as if I measure them in some other direction. Uh, and any single crystal that we look at is going to be anisotropic. Um, let's, let's think about one example that you're all familiar with. Um, that's graphite, which is uh, what is used in pencils in place of lead now. Um, and we think about graphite as a very, very soft material. And indeed, that's true. If I write with my pencil on a piece of paper, uh, some of that graphite uh, gets left behind. So if we look at the crystal structure of graphite, we actually see sheets of hexagonal carbon. They're very strongly bonded together, um, and they're weakly bonded to sheets above and below them. Uh, and so what that means is that the bonding strength in this direction is very, very weak. Uh, and when I write, I'm liable to flake off uh, little sheets of graphite. And that's why I leave behind a black line when I'm writing with a pencil. Uh, but it's important to note that the bonding in the plane is very, very strong. Um, one single sheet of graphite is what we refer to as graphene. And the strength per weight of that material is stronger even than something like steel. So this is one of the strongest materials we know. So this is a great example of something that is uh, very anisotropic. The crystal structure is anisotropic, and that means that the physical properties are anisotropic. Um, one other point that's worth bringing up is that if I look at the properties in one direction, say the 100, and I look at the properties in another direction that's related by symmetry, say the 010 direction, if these two directions are symmetrically equivalent, 
then I would expect the properties to be identical. So that is, if I took a single crystal that happened to be cubic, uh, and I measured, say, its elastic modulus in the 1, 0, 0 direction, and I measured it again in the 0, 1, 0 direction, I know these two directions are symmetrically equivalent. Um, and that means that the properties are also going to be equivalent in those two uh, directions. So this is a very important uh, lesson to learn, and that is the symmetry of the properties of material is related to the symmetry of the crystal structure. Okay, we talked about single crystals some, but many, many of the materials that surround us uh, on and that we interact with on a daily basis are actually polycrystalline. And what that means is that they're made up of an assemblage of individual single crystals. So this is one grain, and this might be a single crystal that has some particular orientation. And then there's a neighboring grain next to it. And so this also has some orientation, but it's not necessarily uh, related to the grain next to it. It is definitely not uh, identical. And so I can keep doing this, um, and each grain is liable to have its own particular uh, orientation. Now, if I look at the boundary between two uh, grains, this is what we call a grain boundary. And I look at it at a very, very small scale, then I might see something like this. This is a transmission electron microscopy image of a grain boundary. So I see one crystal lattice over here. And I see another crystal lattice over here. And I can see that they're uh, at different orientations. Uh, they're, they're at different orientations than uh, the neighboring grain. Um, right along here is the grain boundary. And so what has been observed is that atoms tend to configure themselves to take the lowest energy configurations along those grain boundaries. So oftentimes we see uh, repeating units uh, that are periodic along that grain boundary. Okay, this is a polycrystalline material. Um, what's an example? Well, I'm sure when all of you go back to your dorm rooms this evening and, and go into the bathroom, you'll see lovely granite countertops. This is a great example of a polycrystalline material because it's very visible and you can see it with the naked eye. So in something like granite, you actually have two types of feldspar, uh, this pinkish material and this milky whitish material. So those are two different phases. We have quartz, that's the kind of gray colored material. And then we have biotite, which is a kind of a mica, that's the black material. So we actually have four different phases, but even more than that, each individual crystal has its own orientation with respect to each other. Um, so I can look at this grain of feldspar, maybe it's oriented this way, and I have some quartz here, it's oriented in a different direction, and then we're back to feldspar over here, some other orientation. So this is an example of a polycrystalline material, material that's made up of a large assemblage of single crystals. Um, like I said, this is a fairly uh, intuitive example because it's something we can see with our naked eye. Many other materials, for example, a lot of metals, also are polycrystalline, um, but you can't, uh, the grains are small enough um, that you can't necessarily visualize them uh, with, your in, with your naked eye. Okay, now let's talk about the physical properties of polycrystalline materials. Remember, each one of these is an anisotropic single crystal. Um, so the properties in some direction are not necessarily the same as the properties in some other direction. But remember, in a randomly oriented polycrystalline material, the neighboring grain has uh, a different orientation, and therefore uh, the, the properties uh, are not necessarily consistent throughout the material. And if I take an average of enough randomly oriented grains, what I'll see is that the properties are going to be independent of direction. And this makes sense, right? Because uh, I'm taking a lot of things that each have uh, anisotropic properties I'm randomly mixing them up. So if I measure across large enough length scale, um, say the elastic modulus, really it's going to be the average of all of these uh, individually oriented uh, single crystals uh, along that direction. So this is what we call uh, an isotropic material. 
So the properties are the same uh, regardless of what direction that we're measuring them in. Now, you'll notice that I kept saying randomly oriented polycrystal, uh, polycrystal in material, and that's very important because when we uh, do things to materials to physically manipulate them, oftentimes we lose that random orientation. So for example, if I take a sheet of metal and I cold roll it, so I'm going from a larger cross section down to a thinner cross section, in that process, I'm going to orient the crystals. So whereas before um, I had a bunch of randomly oriented crystals, now they're kind of going to tend to align in some particular direction. So this is what we call preferred orientation or textured materials. Now if I measure the properties again uh, in the, the part that's randomly oriented, they're going to be isotropic. It doesn't matter which direction I measure them, they're going to be constant the same. But if I come over here um, to the part that is textured and I measure the physical properties, say, uh, again, the elastic modulus, um, now I'm going to find that uh, the elastic modulus is going to depend on the direction I measure it in. And that's because I've, I've sort of started to orient these. So they're, they're kind of coming back to some intermediate between the random polycrystalline case and between the single crystal case. Now, there's one other uh, state of solid matter that we haven't talked about yet, and that is uh, amorphous material or glassy material. Now, uh, if you remember, in, in a crystalline material, um, the atoms have long range periodic order. So I can get to, um, I can describe the position of some uh, atom by an integral number of lattice vectors. So for example, this atom up here the position can be described as two, uh, the sum of two uh, A lattice vectors and one, two, three, four, and four B lattice vectors. So there's a long range order. Uh, in a amorphous material, I can't do that anymore. Um, so there's no long range order. Now again, um, this is kind of similar to the randomly oriented polycrystalline case because if I measure the physical properties uh, in any arbitrary direction here, um, and if I'm averaging over a long, uh, long enough length scale, then I'm going to uh, obtain uh, equivalent uh, properties irregardless of the direction that I measure. In. So amorphous materials are also isotropic. Okay, so just in summary, uh, remember, single crystals are always going to be anisotropic. Polycrystalline materials that are randomly oriented are isotropic, uh, but once we start to manipulate them, if we roll them or draw them, um, we're going to texture them, we're going to give them some preferred orientation, and that will make them anisotropic. Uh, finally, amorphous materials um, that have no long-range order uh, are always going to be isotropic. The other important lesson that we learned is that the symmetry of the properties of a material are going to depend on the symmetry of the single crystal itself.